Amen, amen, church. Well, again, welcome to Artisan. If I've not had the chance to meet you, my name is Pastor Sam Grosso. My wife Renee and I, we have the honor of being the lead pastors here at Artisan. And I've got a message this morning. Uh, it's part two of a brand new series we dropped last week called I Think I Love You. I Think I Love You. And we're talking all things romantic relationships. And last week we dove into what does it look like to be healthy and single and the reality that um, sometimes uh, within church circles we can almost feel like it's a sin to be single, but it's not according to scripture. We broke that down. What does singleness look like? What should be our language? How should we even talk to singles? Because let me tell you, all the singles in our church are sick of hearing your questions about when they're going to find a boyfriend or girlfriend. I promise you, they all are tired of it. So how do we talk around that? What's our language around that? And then also, um, what does it look like to date? And how do we take scripture, which doesn't exactly outline what we know as dating in American society, that's really just a society practice for dating. It's not a biblical practice. And so how do we take scripture and apply it to the constructs of dating? What does it look like to be healthy in dating and pursue alignment and to actually test to see, is this somebody that I should go into a covenant relationship with? And all of it, we backdropped with Ephesians chapter five, which is one of the most important sections of scripture when understanding what is biblical Christian marriage all about, where it says to submit to one another, therefore, out of reverence for Christ, that there is a mutual submission that's required for marriage, and it's all built on the first, the submission with Christ. And so today we're going to talk all things marriage. And I've kind of had this date circled on my calendar for a while. This is a topic that my wife and I are very passionate about. I've officiated dozens and dozens of weddings. We've gotten to do premarital counseling with many couples. Right now we're journeying with couples within the church that are going through tensions in their marriage or struggles within their marriage. Um, this is not something that we think is just like uh, obligatory programming that a church needs to do. Actually, we understand that marriage is a way that we depict Christ's relationship to the church. And it actually screams, just like they, know, they will know the love of the Father by the way in which we love each other, how backwards is it if the most important and necessary loving relationship that Christians have, which is their marriage, if we're not even depicting the love of the Father through that marriage, it actually really negatively affects the gospel message of Jesus. So I've been passionate, I'm excited to preach this. I'm going to be honest, as I've been prepping and preparing, um, God took it in a different direction than I anticipated. Uh, I felt a heavier burden fall on me as I was preparing than I anticipated. And this morning, I really, the best way I could describe it is I feel like I'm, I am on assignment by the Holy Spirit to teach on this in the way that I feel uh, I've prepared and gotten ready for. I'm feeling the weight of this topic right now. I got emotional this week preparing this, thinking about, you know, all the years of pastoring. It's interesting, so many issues that come up in humans' lives tie back to marriage. You see, for many of you guys, marriage is not a happy topic. There's a lot of you that have had experiences. Maybe you were raised in a home with a toxic marriage. Your example is broken marriages. Maybe you've gone through a marriage already and you think I'm probably condemned as it pertains to this topic. God's probably finished with me on this topic. Maybe there's a lot of pain around this. And before I dive in and begin talking about scripture, I want to first address this is not an easy topic. This is challenging. And every single one of you has been profoundly impacted by marriages. Hopefully every single one of us also, while you may have had some experiences with some really toxic marriages, hopefully you've also been able to be around some really healthy marriages and seeing the fruit and the good and the incredible thing that God does and how he blesses people through marriage. But it's important that before we dive in that you know I can't sit here and talk about every single person's experience, but I wanna take a moment and let you know that if as I'm talking and as I'm sharing, what you get from this message is somehow shame or condemnation, it's the devil lying to you. It's not the truth of God's word. 
You have to understand this, that you are not beyond the reach of God moving through your life in this topic. That, that actually, in fact, that there is healing, there's wholeness, there's, there, there is grace for you. Shame is not God's motivator, grace is. Condemnation is not his motivator, conviction is. And so when we hear a topic that maybe for us is troubled or tense, maybe you've actually had some very real trauma Artisan church does not want to be a church that ignores real pain and hurt and sort of just throws out this idealistic, optimistic version of what marriage should be and then say, good luck figuring it out. You're on your own. It's actually more important to speak to and value the human aspect that comes up within marriage. But just because we've experienced hurt around this topic, could I encourage you, don't lose heart, what if today we started to build our faith again for the marriage we might be able to have, for the people we might be able to help, for, for what it could look like to not lose heart on this topic? So whether you're single, you're divorced, you're widowed, you're married, this topic really matters to you and has affected you more than you realize. So I hope you would lean in and you would open your hearts in a fresh way so God might speak to you today because I believe he's speaking. And what we saw happen in the first service was beautiful. And I really believe that he wants to do the same thing right now. So today I'm gonna make a case first for what bi biblical marriage is. What is marriage according to the Bible? You can go find definitions of marriage from all different um, um, places within society and cultures. And there's lots of different definitions, but what is the Bible's? What does scripture say on the topic? And I am, I'm just letting you know, I am a firm believer that God created marriage, that everyone else's version of marriage is a manipulation of what he made. And so God is the creator. Um, it's really helpful to approach this topic if you first at least gotten to a place where you believe that you are a created being. It really, really helps. Because if I'm a created being, created by a God who wants what's good for me, if I believe that, then I'm gonna trust the models that he creates. That actually, oh, maybe it's what's best for me. So I'm gonna create a biblical case for marriage, first through scripture, and then we're gonna actually look a little bit at um, what sort of our psychology and our biology says about marriage. And, and there's, it's, it's gonna help. And really this is, again, a tough topic because there's so much floating out there around this topic and so much that has been spoken about marriage and that has damaged marriage. And again, the hurt that's happened, but I believe we can take a moment right now, we can pray and we can open our hearts to his word and that God can speak to us today. Does anybody feel like he could do that today? That he could bring some new hope, some new perspective, some new life and breathe on this topic for us. So let's take a moment and let's pray and just turn this next 30 minutes over to him. So God, we come to you right now, and Lord, I just pray that we would just open our hands. Whatever we've been clinging to, maybe it's a viewpoint, maybe it's an experience, maybe it's a mentality that's been hurting us around marriage. God, I pray we would just open our hands, and there would be a willingness to submit to your ways. Your ways are not our ways. They are above our ways. Your thoughts are above our thoughts. And God, you see the, the full picture of our life. And this is a moment, this is a topic that tests our commitment to your plans. This is a topic that tests our commitment to your ways. So God, I pray that we would open our hearts and let you speak right now. Take over, God. Move in this place. And everybody in the house love Jesus said. Amen. Amen. So first thing we're going to do is, is read three uh, sections of scripture. We've got Genesis 2. Verse 24, and I'm gonna sit down to make sure I get through these notes. If I stand up, I'm just gonna get excited. I'm gonna go off on a tangent. I'm only gonna say like a third of what I wanna say. So I'm gonna sit down and we're gonna focus. Are you with me? If you're visiting, today's gonna to feel a little different than a normal message time because I believe this is this important, okay? So stick with me today. Genesis 2, 24, Matthew 19, four through six, and Ephesians 5, 31. Genesis 2, if you don't know, we're still um, during the creation narrative. We're going to pick up really right after uh, God realized that Adam needed a partner and he creates Eve out of his rib. And he says this, he says, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. 
They become one flesh. So essentially God speaks this word out and here we see him breathe this construct, this plan, this design within the creation narrative. So from the very beginning, pre-fall, pre-sin, pre-law, pre-covenant relationship with Jesus, before any of that's happened, God is saying, here's how I've designed it. This is what I affirm. I affirm a man leaving his father and mother, being united to his wife, and them becoming one flesh. And then in Matthew chapter 19, verse four through six, and you do, I could have read a bunch of scriptures in the Old Testament that continued to affirm that view of marriage. We also know there's also a command that's connected to this. He actually commands us to be fruitful and to multiply, to have dominion over the earth and subdue it. And to, he cares about our generations. He cares about what we pass on. And then in Matthew 19, verse four through six, we see Jesus's take on the topic. And, um, you know, there's a lot of moments when you're trying to build um, a theological perspective on a topic like marriage, for example. One thing that's really important to do is to not just say, what does one verse say, but what does scripture say? What does the full canon of scripture back? What does it affirm consistently? And it's also really helpful when something is talked about pre-fall, post-fall, under the covenant of the law in the Old Testament, and then gets affirmed by Jesus, and then also is talked about post-Jesus's ascension, you can put a lot of confidence in it. So, so if you're seeing it on all, like no matter what the form of covenant relationship God has had with his people, this is something that he has believed and spoken as truth the whole way through. That's a really helpful way to go, okay, I could put some stock in this. So here we see Jesus quote Genesis 2. He says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And then he adds on, so they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Well, does Jesus believe in this whole like monogamous relationship thing? Does he believe? Like, I kind of feel like Jesus was like a passionate guy. I feel like he was kind of all about like me and my feelings. Like, does he believe in that structure? Like he came to get rid of the law. Don't you know? No, he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. So the civil and ceremonial parts of the law we're not living under, but the moral components and structures and the fabric of God's creation and his design Jesus affirms, and he affirms it here. This is so important. And then Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31, now we get a letter to a church. We get the Apostle Paul. This is post-Jesus' ascension. And what does the Apostle Paul say? To a church. This was read in a setting just like this, a church like ours under the same covenant relationship. And it's after the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit's been poured out. All of this has happened. And Paul says this, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. It's starting to get a little repetitive, isn't it? Could, do you think it's repeated by accident? Or do we think there's some intentionality to this repetition? That there might be something here, that there is a structure here, that there is something helpful here, but how many of you know, it's like, man, there's not saying a lot. Like, okay, so I cleave for my parents, which some of y'all, the main reason you got dysfunction in your parents or with your, in your marriage is because you never cleave from your parents. You're still having your mom take care of you. It's like, come on, mom's got to go away. Now you're married now. Step into marriage. You got to separate. You got to get married. You have to have this moment. You become one flesh. But like, what else? Like, did, did they just leave us hanging there? Is that it? Because marriage is complicated. Marriage is for life. Covenant relationship, like this is hard. This is, do they know it's hard work? Do they know it's challenging? Do they know all the other ideas that are out there about sexuality? And do I really need to stay true to one partner? Like, okay, so I'm one flesh with them, but like, does this leave room for me to like explore? <laughs> does this like leave space where I can kind of like go have fun on the side and like sort of um, chase after whatever desires I have that aren't being met by my spouse? Can I kind of like go off? and do what I want, but the reality is, so we understand the structure is affirmed all the way through, but then the other thing that is affirmed consistently is what we find in Hebrews 13 and 1 Corinthians 7. Hebrews 13, 4 says, marriage should be honored by all. Now notice, they're saying being honored by all because how many know sometimes 
there are single people who don't honor a marriage and they become infatuated with somebody that's in a marriage and they begin to pull that person from the marriage. It's supposed to be honored by all. We all are in the business of helping each other's covenants. We are all in the business of helping each other's purity. We are all are in the business of honoring marriage. It should be honored by all. And the marriage bed needs to be kept pure for God will judge the adulterer, those who invite in extramarital activities and all the sexually immoral. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we see another beautiful text. Stick with me here. I want to continue teaching the word because it's so helpful. And how many of you know um, this is not language that you can find all the time on social media right now. This is not language you're going to find all the time on the news or in other spaces or on podcasts. It's so important. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, just like Ephesians 5 we talked about last year, the, or last week, sorry, the Apostle Paul kind of brought through this like revolutionary idea of submitting to one another. If you don't know, in antiquity, it was all societies were misogynistic, like all of them. Like people were not empowering women anywhere in the world. Like, they, like everywhere, men were the masters of women. And it's so funny that Ephesians 5 is a verse that some Christians have appropriated to try to minimize women when it's actually a verse that empowers equality within a marriage. And it talks about, yes, man is the head, but he is the lead servant. And that actually you are to submit to one another. It's a mutual submission. Well, the apostle Paul doesn't stop at Ephesians 5. He actually goes and empowers women again in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So it's also really funny when people try to use teachings of Paul, single verses isolated to disempower women, when the apostle Paul up to this point, you'd be hard pressed to find an author that was more affirming and empowering to women in all of history prior to Paul. Like his ideas around women were radical. They were, this was actually, and this verse is one of them. He says, now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man to have sexual relations with a woman. How many know the whole church is like, yeah, <laughs> that's right. I like this guy, Paul, preach it. He says, but since sexual immorality is occurring, hold on, what, Paul? Each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. You'd be like, that probably wasn't revolutionary. Here's what was revolutionary. Women were absolutely expected to, to, to have complete fidelity to their husband. Husband, you could, be, you could have all types of infidelity. You got passions, dude. You're a guy. Come on, you can't control your body. You got to do what you got to do. Come on, go, go off and, and do what you need. But woman, you need to be fully submitted. So right here, the apostle Paul is shocking them. And Greek thinking, actually, which he had to adjust a lot of Greek thinking when he wrote letters to the church in Corinth, Greek thinking was really anti-marriage because they said you can't, it was very Freudian in nature. You can't explore all of your sexual urges if you're limited by a single marriage. So Greek was, a, the, the, the Greek ideas and philosophers, they were against um, uh, a single partner. And so here, the Apostle Paul is affirming your wife and your wife only, your husband and your husband only. And the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. Here he's bringing up more of Ephesians 5, mutual submission to one another. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. Again, that was widely accepted. And then he goes on and he says, in the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. So do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So here, the apostle Paul is affirming one man, one woman, devoted to one another, covenant relationship, not um, operating in adulterous, sexually immoral side activities, but being fully committed to that relationship. So clear. It's so clear, church. And he was talking to a culture so similar today. By the way, if anybody wants to act like they're, so what they want to do is they want to paint this picture. I'm especially going to talk to young adults for a moment, okay? Let me, let me help you. So what people are going to try to do is be like, oh, 
Are you kidding me? You're, you're trying to practice some ancient view of marriage. That's so old. That's so old school. Like, that, come on, we're, we're smarter than that now. We've grown past that now. There's so much new thinking. I want to remind you, their sexual sin is far from new, and they're actually less perverse than many cultures and generations that came before them. Okay, read about Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, read about the, the Greeks. Read about the orgies. Read about what they had carefully. Be careful what you Google with those kinds of words. But you need to study some of the history and realize they're claiming that what you're pushing is ancient, boring, and old, and disproven. What they're proving, what they're pushing has been proven to create dysfunction and to destroy societies for all of mankind. Just so you know, sexual awakenings, as they call it, leads to the diminishing of strong marriages, the diminishing of strong households, and it leads to the diminishing and the destruction of nations. Track sexual awakenings with the fall of great nations. Because a divided house can't stand. So when you're not united together as one, your house can't stand. And what do you pass on generationally? Do you pass on healthy boundaries, structure, discipline, health? Or do you pass down dysfunction and lack of boundaries and, and confusion? Well, it's just about me and my desires and my pleasure. And God's saying, actually, I care about what you pass down from one generation to the next. And so it's so vital, but I love to go, oh, wait, you think your, your ideas are new? You think you're the first one to stumble across this? There's a reason why humanity moves away from it. Progressivism, when it comes to sexuality, always leads to a level of depravity that goes against human nature and a pushback comes on it. So for me, I'm completely, just so you know, you can make your decision, I am so confident in following the ancient guidelines for a healthy marriage. And I'm just gonna be honest, from my experience, and I'm 10 years in, still pretty new, but I have had enough experience. It's the best thing that's ever happened to me. I love being married. It is the best thing. What Renee and I have in our connection and our unity and our intimacy and our trust and our passion and what is possible within marriage, I believe in this wholeheartedly. This is the answer. And so um, you'd be like, well, Pastor Sam, but like, yeah, I understand like there's some of that sexual depravity out in the world, but like we can't judge them according to scripture. And I'm gonna be honest, I don't. So when somebody says, I don't align with scripture, I go, okay, I'm not gonna hold you to that. But what matters is, and one of the problems is, is when people who say they hold to scripture don't. That's where hypocrisy comes in and people go, you say you believe it, but then you don't. And now look at the dysfunction. And that's where you get 50% divorce rates. Some people see a 50% divorce rate as a basis and an argument against a relationship between a man and a woman and a covenant and staying true in one flesh. When in fact, all it shows is what happens when you break that covenant when you don't keep the marriage bed pure, when you let other things in. Um, and now we've come to a place in society where the Freudian idea that the only unhealthy expression of sexuality are the sexual desires that are left unexplored. This has now become mainstream. He was condemned in the early 1900s, and yet now it's like, that's just what you do. You explore all the desires and the passions you have. And if you're not getting fulfilled from your spouse, you got to look somewhere else, right? You got to go find it somewhere else. They're not doing their duty, so now it's up to you. You got to go explore. And there's actually apps for this. There's apps now that are designed for people who want to have extramarital affairs, people who are married, looking to sleep with other people. One of the most popular ones is Ashley Madison, and it's an app for that, and it has over 70 million users. And if we're wondering if this isn't a crisis, did you know of those 70 million users, 73% of them, while creating their username and profile, marked their religion as Christian? 73%. People saying, I'm a Christian. See, that's what people have a bigger issue with than anything else, is when you say, I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to follow the Bible. I'm not going to trust this. I'm not going to actually see it through. That's where kids are raised in homes and they see one thing being preached and another thing lived and then there's confusion. 
Now, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has moments. And if you're here, again, this is not a shaming message. And if you've slipped up and you've made mistakes and you've broken a vow and you're in that, this is not condemnation. And I believe you're in church because you're trying to make progress. None of us are perfect. You're moving forward. But realize what matters is, are we doing everything in our power? Are we attempting to uphold this biblical view of marriage when, once we get into it? And also, are we empowering young people to even know what the biblical view of marriage is before they make the commitment? Are we making sure they're educated and understand? A woman named Esther Perel, who's a world expert in human relationships, her estimate is that up to 70% of females and up to 75% of males are cheating on their partners. That's a massive statistic. See, what the problem is, is we can't rate monogamous relationships based on those who are breaking the covenant and say it's unhealthy. What we need to look at is what is the fruit of the people who stay true to this? What's the fruit of the people who fight for their vows and fight for their covenant and fight to make this happen? What, what does that look like? And Esther Perel also says that cheating is just a symptom of the underlying root cause of disconnection because you get married and then let's be honest life is distracting life is hard especially you get kids right away it's hard and all of a sudden you stop investing many of you guys your marriage is in trouble because you stopped dating you thought dating was just to get my spouse now I got my spouse I don't need to date anymore Husbands, you just let Valentine's pass right by without doing anything, even a slight romantic gesture. I'm gonna be totally honest. I didn't do much on Valentine's Day, but I couldn't miss it. We literally, we had work and kids midweek and we were, I was serving in Rangers. She was serving in Jeff. It was like the most least romantic day possible. I mean, there was nothing stirring up romance like serving in gems and rangers, right? Like, I mean, come on. But you, but you got to make sure there's flowers and a card and words and chocolates and whatever. It's like, well, that's cliche. If it's cliche, all I had was a cliche on this Valentine's Day, but it's something. What am I saying? I'm making sure she knows my connection. I love you. And just because we're busy doesn't mean I didn't think about you and, and, and send texts and phone calls and whatever you can to say, I'm going to keep the connection hot. I'm gonna keep this fire burning because the, the reality is when it comes to the justification of extramarital affairs, it comes often because from the, the devil dangling the lure of unlived lives in our faces. And see, one of the problems is we get into marriage and there's some sort of fantasy. There's some sort of desire. There's some sort of idea. There's some sort of thing that we want to feel fulfilled that we feel isn't being met. And so the devil reminds us, remember that? Remember what you wanted? Remember what you thought would be this? Remember, remember that, that, uh, that expectation you had that's gone unmet? And he begins to create this lure of an unlived life. And how many know it's gotten a lot harder now that we see everybody's lives on social media? And so you see all these different lives you could live. And all of a sudden the devil wants to start to lie to you and say your spouse is in the way of the life you were meant to live rather than saying your spouse is actually the outlet of your unity, but if you would submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, you will experience the greatest life you could ever live. Now I'm gonna lie to you and speak the opposite. I'm gonna make you believe that the way to live your best life is on the, uh, as, as on the other side of your marriage. Once it's broken, there's this lure that he wants to create of unlived lives. And well, again, some take the overwhelming stats of failed marriages as arguments against monogamy, brain chemistry, anthropology, and psychology have all proven we are hardwired. We are actually created. Again, do you believe you were created for this type of relationship, this type of marriage? And um, there was a, a theory that was dropped in the 1970s called the attachment theory. And um, it at first was considered revolutionary. A lot, a lot of people accepted it. But over time, it's been tested. And many that are in the psychology space and therapy space now have different versions of the attachment theory that they've seen prove true, where Christ, or Christians, humans, were created with the need for attachment. And so essentially, when you're born, you need a caregiver. And you're looking for a committed attachment that you can feel consistent care from, and you connect with that person. And as you grow older, what is that proving? That, hey, you actually, your father and mother, and then a day comes where you actually need to cleave. They leave their father and mother and become one flesh. And that needed commitment and connection then gets transferred to a spouse. And uh, neuroscientist Matthew Lieberman said this, love and belonging might seem like something we can live without, 
How many of you know you can pursue sexual fantasies without love or belonging? You can, you can pursue all of that without commitment. But he says, it may seem like something you can live without, but our biology is built to thirst for connection because it is linked to our most basic survival needs. You are longing for connection. You were hardwired. You were created. It is not good for you to be alone. You desire, you long for connection. So here's an important question. That's, again, a neuroscientist speaking about your makeup. And again, there is so much on this. If you study, there's so much that's been learned about the human brain, our biology, our, our chemistry, um, our psychology. And actually recently even, for example, the, um, the, the effects it has on the body if you are addicted to pornography or if you are constantly um, pursuing lots of sexual partners. Harvard actually just did an incredible study. I can't remember what they labeled it. I read the whole thing. Harvard just released a study about how unhealthy it is because you are actually training your body for um, irregular dopamine hits and it actually creates an, a decrease in dopamine, a decrease in pleasure. You actually receive less from it and, and it actually turns you, makes you very numb to all of those connections. It actually makes it harder for you to have human connection. So the more partners and the more porn you look at, the, the harder it is for you to connect in an intimate way with a human. So it's actually retraining your brain away from the type of connection you were made to. And if Harvard's saying it, can I remind you, that's not a biblical perspective. <laughs> and so we understand, we're learning this about our bodies. And so do you, so we're hardwired for connection. So do you, would you agree with the world? And even though, again, the Freudian idea that true connection only requires consent. Because this is the greatest virtue America is going to offer. All you need is consent. If you have consent, anything goes, right? So connection only requires connect or consent. Or do you believe scripture where it says, actually, true human connection requires commitment, a commitment to Christ and a commitment to the other person, and a covenant relationship with Christ and a covenant marriage relationship? Which one? You see, the world is seeking consent. Well, God asks for commitment. And I personally, I want to live with the end in mind. I want to live my life understanding God doesn't just see my day and my desires. He sees my whole life laid out. And I want to trust him not just with today. I want to trust him with my whole life. And so I'm committing to God's calling and purpose for my life. And the tension is, this is when your faith gets tested. I know we're getting quiet. I know this is intense. Please stick with me. Are we okay? Are we okay? Can I keep going? All right. So, so listen, your faith is tested the moment God asks you, asks something of you that doesn't align with your desires. That's when faith is tested. Do I trust God even when I don't feel like it? Because what I feel like doing is exploring this fantasy I have. What I feel like doing is getting a stress release. What I feel like doing is dreaming up the lure of unlived lives and going off and trying to be somebody else. What I feel like doing is responding to where I am today. See, the faith, whether or not we have faith, isn't tested until God goes, do you trust my providence and my plan and my purposes more than your pleasure. Which one? Do you want to build your life according to your pleasure? Which is always changing. And how many of you know the thing that brought pleasure once doesn't bring pleasure after 20 times? You keep eating that special treat, it's not special anymore. You keep going to that thing over and over and over again, it loses its allure. It loses its drive. So God's saying, I've got a better way. I've actually got the only way that's going to build passion and intimacy. I've actually got the only way that's going to grow this thing in you because I'm going to actually have your drive be love, not lust. Because what is love? What is love? I've actually heard a great definition recently of biblical love that biblical love is to will the good of someone else. 
to say, I, the way I love Renee is I'm going to will her good. I am going to put, make my life, one of my life focuses, her good, her pleasure, her joy, her, I want to meet those needs of her. That's what love looks like. So within a marriage, it's this mutual trust and commitment where we submit to one another. So what do you think? Does real connection just require consent or does it require a commitment? And what better commitment than to say one's vows, to make declarations, to say, this is what I'm gonna do. And so really, let me ask you another two questions. So here's the big question. I'm gonna be honest, as a pastor and a leader, yes, but really as a person, as a human, as a Christ follower, I have come to the conclusion that this view of biblical marriage is what's best. And what's interesting is, and it's, I get access to more broken marriages than you do. I know which ones are struggling. They come to us. So yet, I'm a person who sees the most broken marriages, and yet I believe in it the most. Why? Because I've also seen a lot of healed marriages. I've actually seen a lot of hope brought through marriage. I've seen a lot imparted into the next generation. I've seen so much good come of marriage. So I personally don't think the question is, do you believe you were designed to live a sexually moral existence? For me, I've answered yes. I do believe I was created intentionally, crafted by an artisan God, handmade, that he knows what's best for me, and that I trust his hardwiring for my life. I believe I was designed to live a sexually moral, moral existence. I believe the proof in my biology and my chemistry and my psychology and scripture and ancient practices are a resounding yes. But that's not really that hard of a question to answer in my opinion. The harder question is, on my worst day, not my best day, do I actually believe that following God's design for marriage and sexuality is the best option for my life? It's one thing to say he made me for it. It's another thing to actually on your worst day, live it out. Yeah. Come on, we're not, I don't really believe we're gonna be held accountable on judgment day. We're gonna stand before Jesus and he's just gonna focus on all of our best days. On those days when there was no problems and no struggle and no tension and the weather was perfect and everything was great, you did awesome. There was no temptation, there was no trial and you did it, great job. I believe I'm gonna stand before Jesus and he's gonna go, who were you on your worst day? Who were you on that moment when it was tested? Who were you on that moment when your vows came into question and you were tempted and you were reminded of that fantasy that you never got to explore from high school? But actually, by the way, just so you know, when it comes to sexual desires, I don't have time to get into this. If you study it, um, most sexual desires come out of our life experiences. So they are learned psychological responses more than they are hardwired. This is at least what um, scientists believe. So the, you are the sum of your experiences. And so for a lot of people, they're like, well, I want to explore all my sexual desires. Did you know a lot of those fantasies come from trauma in your life? So if the root cause of that fantasy is trauma, do you think that's a healthy thing to explore? Or is that something you say, actually, that's a desire, I, that's a thought I need to take captive. I need to be transformed by the renewal of my mind. And I probably need to work through that trauma. I need to talk to someone. I need to process why I would have that desire. I need to trace it back to its roots and understand it. And also, just so you know, you're not filthy for your desires. We've got in this room, all types of desires and fantasies that have come from all different types of experiences across all different spectrums of sexuality. And you're not toxic for those desires. The question is, am I going to live by them? Are they gonna become my identity? Am I gonna label myself or am I gonna submit them at the altar? Am I gonna work through it and understand myself better and grow and pursue a healthy marriage relationship? Amen, can I get amen on that one? Okay. Good, I just wanna make sure you're with me. So what am I really preaching on today as the keys come on up and we close? I'm talking about submitting to the necessary commitments so that you can build a marriage on the foundation of trust. Trust is built by consistency and commitment over time. So if commitment is needed, if my soul and my body longs for a committed connection with somebody, 
I gotta build that trust for that type of commitment through consistency over time. G.K. Chesterton has a beautiful quote on this. He says, love is not blind. Talk about love being blind. This is the last thing that it is. Love is bound. And the more it is bound, the less it is blind. He's saying love is actually designed to be bound together in love. That there's actually a covenant relationship that is required to fully understand love. You can understand lust without marriage. That's really what you're trying to explore. The thing that keeps many people out of covenant relationships or breaks their covenant relationship, it's not love, it's lust. And lust is insatiable. It's a desire for what you don't have. How many of you know you never appreciate the thing you lusted for once you got it? And the moment it's over, there's shame. You are hardwired to be ashamed of the thing you lusted after. Why? Because it's sin. You were made that way. Nobody has to make you feel ashamed for the thing you lusted after. It's a natural reaction. It's a natural reaction when, you, when you're coming of age. It's a natural reaction around this. But love is not that. Love is bound. Love is laying one's life down for the other person. Love is to will the good of another. Love is to put their needs first. Love is to hold true to some vows. Love is to say, I'm going to be consistent and make a commitment over time. That's what love is. Again, Ephesians 5, 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You see, for so many of us, we've seen these broken marriages. We've experienced broken marriages. We've seen marriages fall down. Some of you have walked through all different types of pain around this. But submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ is a key. Is Jesus at the center or are my needs at the center? What's hard to, let's just be really honest, give, give ourselves some grace. In a marriage, it only takes one person to break a marriage. It only takes one person to put their needs first and the marriage will slowly fall apart. That's all it takes. And that's hard. That's hard. So we're saying, no, I'm actually gonna put my trust that you're gonna continue to put my needs first while I continue to put your needs first. I'm gonna submit. I'm gonna give you four things super fast. And you're gonna have questions off all four of these. And that's a good thing because next week we're gonna have a panel and we're gonna talk about questions around relationships, marriage, dating, all of it. It's gonna be great. And you can bring your questions and we'll post it on social media so you can ask some questions even ahead of time. But what does it look like to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ and build a healthy marriage? Um, so it's hard to submit what you do not share. Think about like a courtroom when somebody submits evidence. What are they required to do by law? They have to share it with everybody. They have to submit the evidence to everybody. And so they submit it. You can't submit what you don't share. You can't submit what you hide. So if you want to be in a healthy marriage, you have to be ready and willing to submit your story. The first topic that we go through in premarital with couples is actually family of origin. And we've never had a session where the couple doesn't learn something about the other person's family. Because it's odd. We don't naturally want to share the sum of all of our experiences, even in engagement. Some of you right now are married and you haven't told your spouse a bunch of your really formative experiences. Like you have these moments that kind of shaped you and made you, but maybe you have shame about them. Maybe you're embarrassed by them. But that means you're holding, you haven't submitted. You can't submit what you don't share and your story matters. But you're so afraid of maybe some language you've heard like generational curses and you're like, I feel like I'm just gonna have an affair because my parents had an affair. I feel like I'm gonna become an alcoholic because my parents were. I'm not big on the language of generational curse. I, I think really more what the biblical precedent is, is there's generational sin. So sins do get passed down and, and, and often it's harder to battle the sin that you didn't see your parents overcome. And so it's really important to talk about those things, to talk about family of origin to talk about ways in which your upbringing affected you. And Renee, we've spent so much time peeling back the layers of our stories. Are you willing to submit your story though? Those are my experiences. Those are my secret. No, let them know. Why well, don't trust them with it? Okay, then you might want to invite another couple in 
and get some counsel on this. This year we're going to be launching marriage coaching, and I can't wait. It's going to take us a while to do it, right? Pastor Sony and I have already started the conversations. Well, basically, and you could sign up. I believe uh, marriage nights are awesome, and churches do incredible marriage nights all around our city, and we'll probably do one eventually. But big events should be the fruit of a ministry, not the ministry. So, um, I, I, you know, it's really awesome to have a marriage speaker but I'm telling you, all the fruit, all the progress we've made has never been from a single sermon. It's been from doing life and getting advice because all of your marriages are so unique. One of the challenges of the biblical model of marriage is God saying, hey, I've got one solution for you. And that's where people push back. They're like, yo, we're all diverse and unique and we're all made so unique. He made you that way. And so the beautiful thing is every marriage gets to be highly unique. The covenant is similar, but then the expression is completely unique and individual. And it's beautiful and it's incredible. And you get to peel back the layers of what that marriage looks like. And there's nothing better than to take a couple that is further along in the marriage journey. They're not perfect. Never met a perfect marriage yet. They're not perfect, but they've made some more progress than you. And they can advise and speak in and maybe peel back the layers and create an environment where you feel safe to share something that maybe you didn't or whatever else. So we want to do coaching. I'm going to I'm gonna power through these last three. Submit, I gotta, in order to submit to one another of reverence for Christ, I have to be willing to sub submit my dreams. There's a lot of dysfunctional marriages because the two people never actually tested their alignment in their dating. And so they're still pursuing all of their own life only. They're not heading in the same direction. So they, they go their separate ways all day and then they wonder why they come back together and they don't feel unity. It's because you're not heading in the same direction. So we have to be willing to submit our dreams and our desires. There's been so many adjustments to Renee's plans for her life and my plans for my life. But what's been beautiful is it's all come out better than we ever could have hoped. Because when you submit to this, you actually get new dreams because some of you guys are just holding on to your dream from when you were 15. You didn't know what you wanted. Come on, grow up, get past it. Well, they just don't support me. I remember watching Camp Rock and I wanted to be a Joe bro. I just want to be a Jonas Brothers. And why can't I make it big? And I'm still holding out to my music. Like, calm down, dude. Get over it. Like, let it go. We base our lives off some really weird dreams. That's a whole other topic. I'm just being honest. Like we use some low level, low lying dreams. This is who I am. And it's like, just lay it down. <laughs> lay it down. Got to submit our dreams. That's a hard thing to do. This is another journey. It's kind of a daily practice, man. Are we heading in the same direction? Do we, are we still both, do we both feel valued in the life we're building? Do we both feel we matter? Do we both feel we can express who we are within this dream that we've, we've built? And sometimes the best things happen. It's a little illustration. I remember when we were trying to uh, buy a house and uh, our latest house, we'd actually done four live-in flips to roll money over because we wanted to, I'm just gonna be honest, we wanted a better house than what a pastor's salary can afford. And so we would, by hand, fix up these homes and roll all the money into the next house, next house. We were finally in a position to buy a house that we thought we could raise our family in. And I was so tired of renovating the houses. I was like, my dream is I just want a normal new build in a neighborhood. I just want a suburban cul-de-sac thing. And Renee's like, your dream is wrong. And she's like, I know better. We're gonna get land and we're gonna get chickens. And I'm like, no, and I was like pushing back on it. And weirdly, I felt the Holy Spirit say, submit, she's right. I did. And I submitted, we bought this house out on two and a half acres and, and we got chickens and we got all this land and everything. And that land has been so healing for me in all the hardest seasons in the last three years. It's become my safe space. I can't imagine my life without it, but if I hadn't listened to my spouse, I wouldn't have it. I'd be living like, you know, in a fishbowl with all my neighbors looking at me change in my room, like change. And I can walk around my whole house naked and no one will ever see me. I mean, it's awesome. Come on, I got privacy. It's, it's incredible. Um, submit your money. You gotta be willing to submit your money. It's our money, not my money. It's our story, not my story. It's our dreams, not my dream. It's our money. One of the quickest things to discover tension is around money. A lot of marriages have broken down because of money. Even one of our premarital's years ago, there was we were having a conversation and we started to talk about finances and have you been fully honest about your credit card debt and all the different things that you do? And, and the guy kind of got real quiet and I was like, felt the need to press. And um, we ended up finding out that he had an account with $30,000 that he had, 
kept aside. And his mom said, whatever you do, don't tell her. That's your money. It's not her money. You need to hide that from her. I'm like, okay, so we need to, let's talk about this. Let's talk about our money and, and breaking this down and saying, hey, actually we're going to become one flesh. So are we willing to submit that? How you go about saving, spending, bills, who manages it, who doesn't, it? all of those things. Your generosity, it's a joint decision. Pray about it together. Money is a great opportunity to pray and follow God's lead. And the last one, I have to submit my needs. This is the hardest one. This is the hardest one. It's so hard. Be willing to submit my needs. Again, you can't submit what you don't share. Some of you guys, your spouse is not meeting your needs because you never clearly articulated them. And you are holding an expectation of your spouse that you never communicated. Expectation without communication always leads to frustration. Some of you guys have an expectation, like, well, they should just know. Why don't they know? They should just be able to guess. Can't they see it on my face? I'm letting them know I'm mad. I hope they can guess what it is. I'm going to let them, I'm going to have my body language tell a whole story, but I'm never going to communicate, hey, I don't feel loved. Here's why. I could use this or I need this. And there's a way to communicate your needs without shaming the other person. It's a way to do this and submit it and say, hey, I need help with this. You have to be willing to submit to the other person and you cannot submit what you do not share and you don't ask them to do something that's unbiblical. And all of your needs that are biblical, your spouse gets to meet and you get to meet theirs. And that mutual submission leads to something so beautiful, so incredible. There's nothing quite like it. And I believe for many of us, it's gonna bring so much health and wholeness. You're going to reshape your family name. You're going to break off generational sins. You're going to raise kids in the house of the Lord. You're going to model healthy marriage for them. You're going to make them want to pursue purity, not because you told them it's bad and that their body's evil and body shamed them into trying to not, um, to stay pure, but you're going to give them an example of something better. Most people fall into stuff because they think it's the best option, but if they'd see a different option, lived out. It's powerful. Why don't you stand to your feet? I'm going to invite the prayer teams forward. I'm going to be honest, this is a Sunday. We start at the 930, hoping you'd come down for prayer. And I know it went a little long today. I could talk for another hour and I'm not going to. Amen. <laughs> There's just so much here. There's so much here. And we've all been so affected by it. But I want the prayer teams to come forward. And I really... Um, this is one of those times I have to say this because a lot of you are going to be scared to come forward because you're like, if we go forward, everyone's going to think our marriage is in trouble. <gasps> we can't come forward. No, no, come forward for anything. If your marriage is in the best place it's ever been, what a time to come forward and say, hey, would you just pray a blessing on us? We got a good flow going and we want it to keep going. <laughs> and so whatever's going on in your marriage, I would invite you to come forward and get prayed over. And let's submit this stuff to God. Artisan is a church that believes in your marriage loves you guys, wants to support you in this, and you got this. You can do it. It's worth it. And healing's possible. Wholeness is possible. Amen? So Jesus, we lift up every single person here, everyone represented. Whew. There's so much, God. We thank you that you created us. You know us. You understand us. You see the intricacies of our lives, our hearts, our minds, you see the marriage between our, our body, soul, and spirit and the interconnectedness of those things and how to operate in health and wholeness with those things. And God, we just, we want to put our trust in your process. We may not be perfect, but we want to trust that process, God. And so we want to step into that today, God. And I believe that today is going to be a marked moment for many marriages, God, that something gets sparked, the willingness to put in some work, some discipline to feel like there's new fuel in the tank, to keep going, to keep fighting for it, that it's worth it, it's worth it, it's worth it. Help us to lay our needs down and serve each other better. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, everybody said, amen, amen. Awesome. Well, we got prayer teams up front.